right. Well, myself and Irvin Hayes are here reporting live from Novi, and uh, we also have Paul Munford on the line who is going to be walking us through the technical portion of our presentation today. Um, hopefully over the next hour or next 45 minutes to an hour, um, you guys will be um, excited about this topic and um, you'll walk away today thinking about uh, new ways that you can engage with your coworkers, um, other departments, and really rethink uh, your company's product data management strategy. Uh, I had already mentioned that we're on the line with uh, Irvin, and um, we also have uh, Paul Munford here, um, who's going to be doing the demo, and um, I will be talking a little bit about um, the overall strategy and talk about a couple um, areas of emphasis around data management, and then um, about 15, 20 minutes into the presentation, I'm going to tag Paul in, and he's going to walk you through uh, a demo overview of um, how a particular piece of Autodesk software would help uh, solve some of these business problems that we've been talking about. All right, well, let's get started with uh, a little bit of a kickoff to level set. Um, so the first thing um, as part of this level setting, we wanna talk about what PDM is. And you know, the most common uh, way people think about it or refer to it is product data management. Perfectly acceptable way um, I've seen some other things out there uh, where people talk about the acronym of PDM differently. One is predictive maintenance as another example from a, a different point of view. Um, but uh, so in my experience, you know, there are a lot of different points of view about what PDM is and what it can be used for. So for today, we're just going to use the definition that we have on the screen, which is for the most part talking about a strategy for managing your product related data and information along with your engineering processes all in one single system or one single location. In some organizations, we drill a little bit further down and if you want a narrower scope um, of PDM in some companies, um, a laser focused approach might be just the engineering management of all of the documents and the deliverables that engineering gives off. So, you know, the definition I have on the screen is talking about product related information broadly in all engineering processes. Uh, in some cases, people might want to think about it just the engineering department only and no other folks. And further in the presentation, we'll talk about distinguishing between kind of a company PDM strategy and maybe an engineering centric PDM strategy. Both are good. Um, it just depends on your organization on what your needs might be. Okay. So let's, uh, let's start with a couple ways to think about just general design data management options many of you have. Um, so the first area that um, we talk about as kind of the basics is Windows Explorer. So many of us who are um, come from a CAD background or have used uh, products like AutoCAD over the years and eventually moved into Inventor, you know there's differences between thinking about how you manage those files with Windows Explorer between 2D and 3D. But when we talk about it from just raw design data management point of view, when we look at Windows Explorer, there really is kind of a limited security system through Windows Explorer. Um, in some cases, you'll have local hard drives where files are being stored. In other cases, you have um, a lot of network uh, information um, or network drives. And then uh, the searching capabilities for Windows Explorer is pretty limited as well. Um, most of us could do a pretty good job of remembering file names or some things in a file, but sometimes CAD-related documents and engineering-related documents, you can't articulate everything you want inside of a file name, and so it controls uh, or limits the ability of searching. A lot of times Windows Explorer doesn't understand CAD data files, um, and it's really important if you're only going to use Windows Explorer, that it requires all of your coworkers and yourself to follow a lot of strict best practices to get the job done if you're only going to use Windows Explorer. Now, for many companies, Windows Explorer isn't enough, and you may add or complement Windows Explorer with some ad hoc tools. These ad hoc tools could be something like Microsoft OneDrive, um, Box, Dropbox, or any of these other types of services that can layer on and expand the functionality from just a local 
um, shares of files to collaborating with others in other departments or outside of uh, your company firewall potentially. And these ad hoc tools help immensely when it comes to some of the rigor of your network by pulling in some of these external parties. But in some cases, IT may not be super happy that you're adding these ad hoc tools. Um, so there's gonna be an increased security concern. Um, you now have local hard drives plus network drives and some kind of third party location where these files are duplicated in a couple different ways. Again, your search may be a little limited. Um, typically the ad hoc tools don't understand much about CAD and we still have those same require, requirements of end user best practices that have to be followed. So kind of moving from block one to block two, and we start thinking about if your organization has invested in a more generic document management system, in some cases something like SharePoint may ring a bell, um, other tools potentially from IBM or a company like OpenText, where it's a very broad corporate strategy to manage documents in a central location with a lot more permissioning, maybe some version control. What we find normally in this box or in this category or level of maturity that many companies, uh, these systems don't really know too much about CAD files, um, but it still solves some of the concerns around data flow and information moving from Windows Explorer all the way up to a generic document management system. But you have better security, better search, all the information will be in one location, but you still have some of those downfalls I mentioned where it doesn't understand CAD and it doesn't integrate with popular CAD tools very often. Now, if you're anywhere, likely at a minimum, everyone's at Windows Explorer. A lot of you have probably used um, ad hoc tools to supplement that. Potentially your organization has this generic document management system. But if you're using anything below an engineering document management um, tool, and a full PDM system, um, you've kind of turned the corner and you're starting to add the potential for a lot more value creation beyond just data organization. And so I'm just using this simple framework for you to kind of self-assess where you're at um, in this journey. So no wrong answers here, no bad place to be. You're on the webcast, so you're thinking ahead and further about different ways that you and your organization can grow with data management. All right, so let's take a slightly different twist on some of the same information. And this time we're gonna talk about how other departments and potentially along your timeline when you're developing the product and releasing the product, others that are gonna be involved. So uh, there's a lot of information in engineering already. And these are your CAD files, um, drawings from potentially customers or vendors, some calculations potentially in spreadsheets, um, you have all of the different CAD standards. Uh, you have all the deliverables versus the engineering files. The deliverables may just be PDFs. And then you have to think about changes constantly um, through the uh, design iteration and life of the project, but then also changes that have come from other departments. Because in most cases, engineering is not just working on projects for fun and they don't get to spend a ton of time in new product development. There's some other change going on in the company that's driving things that happen in engineering. And so when we take a couple of those first boxes and we layer it into the context of just engineering, I like to call this CAD file management as a level of maturity. You know, just having your engineering data locked down, centrally located, easily organized and shared with others is a great thing. Then you kind of move up the stack to PDM, which we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about today, but there's gonna be more involved within just organization you'll have some other functionality. But then we have other business systems that we have to think about at a company where a lot of other data is stored. So when you think only about engineering, there's a lot of great milestones you can make along the maturity curve for PDM and data management, but think about all the other data that's floating around inside of your organization that impacts, influences, or drives what engineering does every single day. And so whether that's stored in a CRM system, um, stored in ERP, there's an opportunity in a lot of cases for data to be duplicated, for spreadsheets to live outside of all of these systems, uh, PDFs living in multiple locations. And what you find over time is if you don't have at least an engineering-centric view 
of knowing all this other data exists and understanding how you influence it or leverage it, it can really get out of control. And I want you to think about today at the end of the webcast and over the course of the webcast that um, we're going to be more in this area of aspiration. We, you know, it's great if you get the CAD file management. If you get the basic PDM, that's fine. But I really want you thinking about PDM beyond or PDM plus where you have data that you can store in the specs area inside of something like Autodesk Vault, or you have change that's coming from other departments that you may want to have influence engineering on a daily basis or get those on the shop floor involved in the drawing review process instead of having it disconnected. And of course, over time, think about the entire company product lifecycle management process. But today we're gonna to be spending almost all of our time laser focus just in this PDM further area. So a slightly different way to look at it, and then we're gonna to go to a poll question, just in case a few of you have already fell asleep today, um, but we just wanna make sure that you can look at this through a couple different lenses and some terminology that maybe you've seen over the years. So when we look at the Autodesk stack of tech that can help around CAD file management, specifically PDM and PDM further, and then of course PLM, these are the types of things um, the various technology can help you accomplish as an engineer, as a team lead, engineering manager, or an IT professional at one of your organizations. There's a lot of things to tackle here. And just make sure, maybe use this as kind of inspiration to print this out or grab a screen grab of this and kind of self-assess um, where you're at for each of these types of things. All right. So let me um, get a little interaction going and go to a poll real quick. And I'm just going to ask my colleagues to make sure um, there hasn't been any technical glitches that have um, I've been uh, ignoring. So if anyone let me know there's um, anything I should be worried about in terms of presentation while I'm doing the poll. All right. So on your end, you should see our first poll. And the question is, is where do you manage your engineering design data today? So we talked about uh, a couple different options um, that are available um, for many of you. And we kind of walked through a series of blocks, uh, those blocks of like a maturity uh, model to think about uh, the various benefits and disadvantages of a couple of the different systems. So hopefully with this poll, you can kind of see uh, which of the areas or help us understand um, where everyone lands. So let's give that about uh, five more seconds. Uh, we've got a large percentage of the audiences voted. We're, we're getting ready to pass the 75% threshold, which uh, at least when I was in school, D was for done. So anything over 60% is fantastic. Um, that's the way I got uh, through school and my education. Uh, so we're already 80%. So let me go ahead and uh, stop this particular poll and um, make sure I don't hit the wrong button there. So close that poll. And let me just see on the audience view, we're back to the slide here. So um, let me just rattle this off. Um, so we had about 65% of the people um, say that they were doing shared network folders. Uh, and then a close, not so close, I guess, second, uh, with 13% of you doing full PDM, and then uh, followed behind cloud shared folders, then basic PDM, and then coming up uh, in the end, or the last spot, was uh, stored on local workstations. So first thing I'd like to say is when I look at that percentage and that distribution, um, I'm glad that a very small percentage of you are keeping files on local workstations. Um, I've been in this industry for a long time, and I know uh, there's still a lot of uh, bad behavior out there on keeping local copies, so it's good it's on the network folder uh, for a lot of you. And then a few, a handful of you, about a third of you, have uh, started doing some things with cloud or a PDM system, so fantastic. Okay, so let me switch and talk about the outline for the rest of my presentation and then before I hand it off to Paul from a technical point of view. So we're gonna talk about three major areas today and then a subtopic within each. Um, the very first one is data. 
Um, and really, PDM comes down to data at the center. Then we're going to talk about people, and we think about all the people that are involved in creating data, collecting data, sharing data, influencing data, and then making decisions around all that data is important. And then the process itself um, that people follow either through a best practice or more rigor around the process of actually controlling what happens when and what type of security is rolled out during which phase of the design cycle or which phase of the change. So when you think about your data management strategy, these are the big, big three pillars, data, people, and process. And then with inside of each of these pillars, there's really seven major focus areas to think about. We're only gonna cover three of the seven today, just from a time consideration. And then obviously you could follow up and work uh, with your partner or an Autodesk colleague about some of these other ones if they're interesting to you. So I'm just gonna do a um, check here real quick on my end on the chat side. And let's go ahead and open up the second poll. And this has just helped us understand a little bit more about the types of information and data before we talk more about data, um, the types of files that you use in your organization. All right, so uh, you can see the question there and the, the voting's starting to take place here and um, glad to learn a little bit more about uh, the way people are, uh, the types of files they're working on. And this will give us a good foundation for the data conversation next. So about uh, five more seconds here. All right, so I am going to go ahead and close that poll. And uh, what we came in from a results point of view uh, was about 38% PDFs, um, almost a quarter around AutoCAD and then uh, another 17% or so with inventor files. And thankfully, uh, printed drawings was in last at around 10%, and then 12% for other 2D and other 3D formats. So just trying to give you an idea of how those uh, polls came back. Okay, well, thank you for uh, interacting there. And we'll have one more poll question in a couple more minutes. But let's talk about data. So, you know, when we think um, typically in isolation about data, it's really just the files or the metadata inside of each of those files. But really at the heart of it, data for this particular topic is, it's all about capturing and reusing engineering knowledge. And that's where most people understand the raw benefits of doing that. Um, but in a research uh, white paper we did with an organization called Tech, Cl Tech Clarity, and we had um, a couple hundred um, submissions back on this study, uh, you can see about 30% of engineers say that reusing design data is a significant challenge uh, when going through the product development process. And what's important is going beyond just reusing data, many engineers don't have a way to revisit any of the past engineering decisions that were made to understand why that decision was made. Sometimes you rely on tribal knowledge um, other coworkers that maybe made the change. So you look at the initials in the rev block and you're like, hey, that was Joe. And you go and talk to Joe about why he made a particular change. Or potentially Joe's no longer at the organization um, and you're just re relying on maybe a 150 word description in your change order form to figure out what the change was. And those types of limitations can um, be pretty restrictive. And so systems like Vault and uh, other PDM systems can help you understand what the decisions were and why a particular change happened when there's good practices and good systems in place. So really want to ask yourself or coworkers, when you think about data, first of all, do you suffer um, from this one in three engineers problem as well around reusing design data? And if you also think about what is some of the value or some of the time lost by trying to reuse data, Potentially reuse also impacts things like tooling costs and manufacturing costs. Um, and, you know, are there other coworkers that you work with that um, sometimes are co um, the creator of some of these challenges? And maybe if you had a system in place, you could better control the output of some of your coworkers and peers. So let's dig a little bit further. Um, and we talk about data. 
this is just going to highlight specifically for capturing and reusing engineering knowledge some of the reuse challenges. So I rattled off a few, but here you can see on the slide a couple additional ones. Uh, if you're using anything paper-based still um, through the markup and the feedback process, sometimes that can be pretty limiting. Um, actually understanding, developing, and distributing all the best practices uh, sometimes makes the capture and reuse of engineering knowledge uh, a pain and a challenge. Um, understanding the whole concept of a part being in use. Um, potentially that's in your ERP system, and sometimes engineers don't have access to ERP, so but you may have to work with other people in the organization to find out um, where parts are being used and what are some of the impacts downstream of a potential change. So when you think about just the data piece and capturing and reusing engineering knowledge is just one data point um, around the whole strategy. So let's switch gears. We're going to move on a little bit further. Um, actually, before I do that, let me just give you a couple customer quotes. I'll let you read these off, talking about a few other um, peers of yours potentially in the industry that have used tools like the Vault to help them understand and realize some benefits around PDM and very specifically data capture and reuse. I have one more here, and this is my favorite actually. Um, any opportunity that I get to use uh, or, or say the words holy grail in a uh, work presentation is fantastic. I'm a big Monty Python fan, and here you can see this particular customer talked about one feature in the vault, how it helped them capture and reuse engineering data and basically saying it was the holy grail feature. So that's pretty fun. Okay, so let's talk about people. Um, all of us as individuals have our own uh, methods and methodologies for maintaining your computer hygiene and your computer files and your email hygiene. And that may not necessarily be what's great for engineering productivity. And as this stat uh, implies, again, based on the Tech Clarity white paper, uh, a decent amount of engineers um, say they're wasting time trying to manage all of this engineering data. And on the other end of the spectrum, you know, moving from 15% uh, a little bit higher, is that about 25% of companies surveyed said that engineers are actually wasting one day a week doing this task. So hopefully you're not in that camp uh, where you're wasting a day a week keeping track of all of your engineering data, but it is a real problem based on the survey and uh, years, our years of experience working with customers, we know a lot of people struggle with this. So really the quick takeaway from this is, you know, think to yourself, how much time are you wasting and how much time is some of your coworkers wasting around keeping track of all of this? And we want to help you improve engineering productivity by reducing that particular barrier. So like with data, there's a couple common sources of time wasters uh, when it comes to people and in in, in improving engineering productivity. So I'll let you glance at a couple of those. So we have a lot of different repositories where you could potentially find data. The, the process of doing a save as or using an existing design file and um, trying to copy that. If you're doing that in AutoCAD, it's not typically that tough unless you have XREFs and that's, um, that can be managed, but when you move to 3D, um, trying to do that with a large assembly of 3D files that have parent-child relationships, sometimes that process um, can be pretty painful. Hopefully you're not personally in the business of printing out large projects for review, but um, sometimes that can be a pretty big time waste and we want to help with engineering productivity, so hopefully you can reduce printing from being painful to uh, maybe a click of a button based on all of the engineering structure and the release packet. And we know everyone on this call, including myself, has some spreadsheet tucked away on their hard drive or on their desktop that keeps track of something that you're not sharing with other folks as kind of the engineer to-do list. Um, but a lot of times spreadsheets in engineering organizations and manufacturing companies are used for so much more than just simple tracking. They're used for really complicated calculations, of course, but also bill of material structures, wear use structures, spare parts, um, all things that could be automatically generated from a bill of material in the CAD file or something that you could integrate with your ERP system on instead of maintaining all these disparate spreadsheets. 
And when we talk about customers that may be benefiting from engineering productivity enhancements provided by a PDM strategy, here's just another quote um, from Jeff at Giffen. They're actually here in the Detroit area. And uh, this talks about how uh, they like to leverage the vault to find a lot of information and help with um, time savings. Okay, so we have one more poll. Uh, let me switch over here and turn on the third poll. All right, last poll here. And this is just uh, setting up the next conversation, which is um, you know, asking a little bit more about how engineering change works in your organization. So we have a couple different options. Um, we know that a lot of people are still gonna have a lot of meetings on some decisions, but hopefully you're not paper-based um, only. That would be uh, pretty painful, but um, it, is, it is an option. And then we have a lot of folks that are uh, graduated towards more electronic forms or email-based ways to uh, handle the change process within their organization. And then potentially you've moved all the way to a digital workflow engine or a process engine through a PDM system, PLM system, or a business process management tool beyond what um, maybe is offered by a CAD vendor. All right, just a few more seconds there and we're getting ready to pass the uh, threshold. And I am glad that I just found a new button in the, the GoToWebinar. So I'm gonna close this out and uh, I will share the results this time instead of just rattling off all of the results. Um, so um, I don't have to do hand puppets now here. Um, I can go ahead and let you review the results here so you can see um, over 60% have uh, moved to a more of an electronic form we still have a pretty decent uh, stakeholder in the uh, paper-based and meetings-based and uh, about 10% in the digital process area. So thanks for participating there. And I have one more topic, um, which is going to be the process part. And um, then I'm gonna hand it over to Paul for a demo in just a couple minutes. So the, the last pillar of a PDM strategy is rooted in process. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, process can be following the same procedure, having a best practice, um, helping others in your organization follow certain guidelines and uh, making sure everyone knows that that's a possibility. And then there's also process more around ISO and documentation, and then price uh, process in, in the form of this is exactly the way we do it and we don't deviate. This is the way our process works electronically. So a couple different tiers there, but um, here you can see again with our- Hey, um, hey Kevin, Kevin, yes. can I stop you for a second? You're, you're still on the poll. Oh, sorry about that. Hide. And how do I look now? Sorry about that. You're back on it, good. All right, good catch, Mr. Sather. Sorry about that, everyone. So, um, you know, everything I was saying is still relevant, um, while a little bit distracting to see something different. But when we talk about process, um, there's a lot of different options, a couple different tiers or levels. But when we continue that same research with Tech Clarity, um, customers came back and said, you know, almost half of all the customers that um, submitted results said they had some form of an issue with managing the change in the release process. And uh, we could see there's a wide variety of responses in the webcast today um, and a lot of different options. Um, but really here, 43%, almost half, um, definitely talked about this challenge. And it comes in a couple different flavors, um, managing change in isolation or the managing of the design project. So just keeping track of the projects as a whole. And um, you know, the way that folks do the review and the approval process, um, overall general project management, and then a bill of material through the engineering process is a really interesting source of a lot of frustration. If you think about your existing products you have today, they have a parts list and a bill of material, whether you design them in 2D or design them in 3D. Your 2D parts lists are pretty generic, but descriptive. They don't have a lot of metadata supporting those parts lists. When you move into 3D, the parts list can be somewhat automatically generated based on the metadata stored in all the files. And that creates this kind of electronic bill of material 
at the CAD structure level. Then you show your parts list on the drawing, but then when you release it to potentially purchasing or manufacturing, you start getting into purchasing bills of materials, um, manufacturing bills of materials, which are potentially deviate from the engineering bill of material. And so the whole bill of material life cycle is a fascinating uh, challenge for uh, at least myself as an industry expert and uh, veteran, but I'm sure many of you are challenged by the same thing. So um, don't just let Microsoft spreadsheets be your only source of bills of material. There's those materials have life cycles and a lot of iterations. And uh, by controlling your engineering processes better, your bills of material can be a lot simpler. Okay. So a couple sources of a challenge uh, around process. Not all everyone in engineering, I'm sorry, those outside of engineering can't always participate depending on the technology or if you're doing this face-to-face -face in meetings and red line markers, it's not always super efficient. Um, the, the actual status of the project is not always easy to understand um, in the, something like Windows Explorer, unless you move them from folder to folder, like in process to release. While that is an um, interesting approach, it sometimes can get the job done from a foundational perspective. It is better process than no process, um, but instead let a tool like Vault or other PDM systems manage the lifecycle states with some rigor and some control to make sure checks and balances are there. And I already talked about bills of material at a little bit length, um, but then you have managers and other project managers that would want to see what's happening in a project, and it's really easy for them to see that in a PDM system. So last quote, um, these guys make fantastic products, um, pretty interesting, a little bit uh, above my pay grade for um, fancy watches like that. But uh, here's just another quote from a customer about how they manage change uh, with Autodesk Vault. Okay, well, thanks everyone for your time so far. I'll come back at the end of the presentation to wrap it up, um, but I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Paul and he's going to uh, show you a presentation of the technology and uh, walk you through his outline. Thanks so much, Kevin. So I hope you found that part of the, the uh, presentation useful to set up here, why PDM is important to us and how we can best take advantage of that. Uh, let me just switch over onto my screen for you. That's fantastic. So um, let me know if you can see my screen okay. You should see a nice picture of uh, Inventor Assembly there. Yep, you're good, Paul. Thank you very much. So what I'd like to do at this point is I'd like to show you a little bit about Vault. Um, I'm going to start with Vault in Inventor, and then we'll move into Vault, and we'll talk about um, search, we'll talk about file sharing, and we'll, we'll take a little look at engineering change orders. I'll see if I can cover as much as I can. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Vault, we kind of have three components for Vault. Firstly, we have the server-based component. So this sits on the server, and it looks after all your files securely, um, and it manages them all on the server. You don't need to access them directly. We have the second component, which is called the Vault Client. I'm going to get to the Vault Client in a moment. The Vault client sits on your local machine and it's your access to the Vault. It's your way to access those files, search, um, and do a couple other operations as well. The third component I'm gonna show you right now is the bit that sits right inside Inventor. So when we look inside Inventor, we can see up here that we have a, a, a Vault tab with our Vault tools. And we also have down here, we have a Vault browser. Don't be alarmed by those exclamation marks. They'll go in a second. So these two tools allow us to get data from the Vault and access it inside Inventor. So I'm just gonna begin here by, by logging into the Vault. I'll just click OK to log into my Vault now. So now I'm hooking up to the server. You can see those worrying exclamation marks have gone. Um, and the Vault browser itself, for those of you who have not been working with um, Inventor 2019 right now, you'll see this is now a, a dockable palette, which is, which is awesome. We can dock it down the bottom. I'm gonna dock it over to the side here, just so we can have these open. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to check the files in and out of the vault. So it allows us to grab those files from the server and bring them to our local C drive. And the reason why that's useful is firstly, because inventor assemblies can be pretty huge. So by putting them on our local C drive, they're going to work a lot faster. And secondly, the check-in, check-out process allows us to control who's operating on the files right now. So uh, while I'm talking, I'll just check this assembly out just so you can see how it works. So I'll click here on check out. I could add a comment right here.
And these files have been retrieved now and stored on my local C drive. Now, anybody else who's accessing the vault or using Inventor can still access the same files, but what will happen is they can reference the files into their assembly, they can open them, they can look at them, they just can't edit them. Um, and this is really helpful. Uh, one of the things I found back in the day when we're using AutoCAD, it's, it's a single document system. So if somebody's working late, you, you kind of can't help them. You just wave goodbye and say, well, have a good evening. When you're using Inventor, you can kind of multi-thread the design office. You can all be working on the same design at once. This guy over here can pick up a few parts. This guy over here can pick up a few parts. But you find if you start to work that way, although there's a big advantage, you start to fall over each other and save over each other's work. So Vault is really helpful. Even just Vault Basic is really helpful to present that happening. So um, when I've checked the files out, I'll do my work, I'll do my edits. I would save these files and then I would check them back in again. So I'll just do a check in here from the Vault browser and I'll say okay to that. Um, so that's just a very quick introduction to the, how, the way that Vault integrates inside Inventor. But let's jump out to the, um, to the Vault client itself so we can see how that looks. So I'm just going to come up here and click on Autodesk Vault. I will need to log in. And here we have the Vault browser. So if you work with AutoCAD or Autodesk Inventor or you're working with the product design collection, you get Vault Basic as part of your um, part of the product. So if you haven't installed Vault, you've only installed half your software, I'd really encourage you to take a look at it. Installing the server component uh, isn't always straightforward. I recommend you get some help with that, but definitely look into it because it's not going to cost you any extra. Now, the Vault client allows us to browse through all the files that we've stored inside the Vault. Um, we can take a look at any of these files and we can see some information about them. So we can see the history of this component, uh, when it's been checked in, when it's been checked out, who's been working on it um, and any changes of state. We can see, in this case, in this assembly file, we can see what files this file is referencing. So this is really helpful for us to navigate through an assembly and make sure if we're making a change to a component or an assembly uh, that it's not going to propagate into another assembly and, and mess that up for somebody. We can see where this assembly is being used. So we can see this assembly is being used by another assembly. And we would see in here any drawings that reference this assembly or any presentation files. Um, and again, because Vault understands these relationships, if we want to move this assembly to another folder, it's just drag and drop. Um, if we want to rename it, we can just right click and rename. It, we don't have to worry about any of that management, which can be a problem outside in Windows. Um, I'm just going to skip along here to the preview tab. So we can see that we have a preview here built in. If, you're, um, if you would like to have other people in your organization access the data that's inside Vault, uh, they can have their own version of the Vault client. They will need to use Vault Workgroup or Vault Professional to have a standalone version of the Vault client. Um, but they can then come in, they can see your files, they can take dimensions like I'm uh, indicating here. They could add markups and review the, the files that you can work on. But the key thing here is we have permission control. Remember, I logged into Vault, um, so I've set my permissions for me. Um, so I'm taking the part here of the, the CAD guy, the, the design engineer. Um, later on, we'll see how I've made a login for Kevin. So he's going to act as the project engineer, the reviewer. And I've also created a login for Brian Say, who's going to represent our manufacturing team. So by giving each people, uh, person individual logins, we can control their permissions. We can control what they can see. And I'd like to draw your attention up here. You'll see most of these files are work in progress. So work in progress just means that these files are currently being worked on by the engineering team, by the design team. So we don't necessarily want anybody outside our office to be able to see these files, um, just so that we don't have people working on the wrong version of the file at any one time. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about file structure. You can see that Vault has a standard file structure, so you can completely map your standard Windows file structure, whatever you've got in there, into Vault if you prefer. But we do have some other options. So um, one of my clients once asked me, uh, I've got a, a whole bunch of uh, engines from one supplier and gearboxes from another supplier. And I don't know whether I should have a folder full of engines and a folder full of gearboxes or a folder for one supplier and a folder for another. In fact, you kind of don't need to worry about that at all. So down here, I have some search folders. And if I click on one of these search folders, you can see that this folder is just searching for everything that has uh, that is a connector that's been tagged as connector. So it doesn't really matter where it is in the vault or which folder it's saved in. When I click search, I always get everything I need to look for. 
So we can keep our folder structures very flat um, and we can just use these search folders to find key pieces of information. And just let me draw attention here. We're not just searching on file name, we're actually picking up connector in the description or sometimes we're picking up uh, connector in the other metadata down here. So we're searching really all the information that we've put in, not just the file name. So I have a connector here, I have a piston, the shaft. So all these things are standard searches that I can produce. Now also up here, I've got a folder here called checked out. So um, this allows me to search the vault for any files that have been checked out. In this case, the files have been checked out by the administrator. If you are using vault, this is a kind of handy tip. Um, do make sure that any files being checked out by one of your colleagues have been checked back in before they go on holiday. So right, so we can monitor what our colleagues are up to and we can see which files they're working on. I've also got down here a folder called for review. So these are files that have now been pushed from a work in progress state to a review state. And I've got a folder here called released. So this is information that's been released to manufacturing. You can see these files have all been locked. So we could say anybody in an organization can come into Vault and view these files. Nobody can edit them because they've been released. And if we wanted to do an engineering change order, we'd have to move them back from a release date back into work in progress. And we would do that with an engineering change order. So let me just take a, a quick look at a, a change order for you. So down here, I have a change order list. Um, I have an open change order. We, we didn't quite have time to show the whole change order process. So I've started one off and we'll, we'll see it finish out. So I have a change order here. The change order number is actually generated by the system, so don't need to worry about that. And we've added in um, a change order title, and then we've added a, a description of what the change order needs to manage. Um, once we've raised the change order, you can see that we can then push the change order through a number of different states. At each state, we can see uh, who has requested the, the state change, and we can also see in the comments what needs to happen. So we have a full log of every element of the change that we can refer back to any time. Gives a lot of clarity to anybody who's managing projects and wants to see what's going on, but it also gives us that history trail. So we know uh, if we look back, we can look back on the past and we can see what happened and why it happened. We don't have to go and hope our colleague remembers. Now I'm going to switch over here to the status tab because I think this illustrates the change order workflow um, most neatly. So you can see this workflow was created. Uh, it was then submitted into the open state. So an open state just means that um, it's like a stage gate. So the, the cab manager or the engineering manager, or maybe even the engineering team themselves can accept that this change order. They can say, yes, I accept it into our workflow. Uh, we have all the information we need. So this change order has reached the work stage. So that means I, as a design engineer, am ready to do the work on this change order. So I would come over here to the files tab. I can see which files have been associated with this change order. We have a markup here that Kevin's helpfully created so I can see what I need to do. So I can see that there's a comment there. And if I zoom into the area where the comment is, I should better see that the comment is pointing to the headstock and it's given me an indication of what I need to do. So that's fantastic. So I'm gonna take the file here. And I'm just gonna right click. The file has been attached to the change order and I'm just gonna open it up in Inventor. Inventor says, do you want to check it out now? And I'll say yes. So these files are now coming in. So here we have the headstock. And we can see that currently I have the main assembly checked out, but none of the parts right now. So the parts could still be being worked on by my colleagues. Um, I've just checked the assembly out to make this change. So I need to make a change down here. I'm just going to switch to part priority, double click on the component to edit. And I'm going to switch to feature priority and I'm going to edit the feature that I'm interested in. So I need to change these these bolts up to an M20. Maybe M20 is a bit excessive, but I just want to make a really big change that you'll definitely see on the screen. So I'll say uh, apply that. Now, Vault knows that I've made a change, so it's prompting me. You don't have this file checked out. Do you want to check it out? And I'll say, yes, please, definitely. I don't want any other colleague to edit this while I'm working on it. So there's my change made. So I can uh, right click and choose cancel out of that. Right click and choose finish edit to get myself back to the assembly. Then I need to change the bolts as well. So I'm just going to switch to component priority and edit using design accelerator. 
Now, I'm sorry if I'm going through the editing part a little fast, but um, we're here to learn about Bolt today rather than Inventor, so uh, bear with me. So I'm going to switch to a size 20 bolt, say yes to that. Again, it's kind of crazy big bolts, but it's nice and obvious change, so you can see that. And again, we can see down here in our Vault browser which files we've needed to check out in order to make those changes. So when we're done, I'm just going to save this whole assembly. And then we can check back in. So back up to my Vault tab, check in. And we can add a comment here. So checked in after updating to ECO. And I'll say OK to that. So now these files, the ones that have changed, are being sent back to the vault uh, where the next person can make some additional changes if they need to. If any of my colleagues are working on these files, they'll receive a little prompt to say there's a new version. They can refresh that version. They'll, they'll see the new file come into their installation of Inventor. So it keeps us all in sync and all in step. So while I wait for this file to check in, I'll just remind you, if you do have any questions for me on the presentation, please feel free to put in the questions box. I may come back to them at the end of the presentation. We'll do a Q&A after Kevin's finished his repeat. Great. So now I've uh, made my edits, there's something else I need to do here. I need to change the state of this file. So this file is currently work in progress. And work in progress means that nobody outside the engineering office can see this data. So I'm going to change this to for review. For review means that uh, in this case, Kevin will be able to see this data. Now, let me just jump back into Vault and we'll see how this works. So if I bring you back into Vault here, so I'm going to log out as me. And I'm going to log in as Kevin. So we'll see under Kevin's login, if I just take you back to the Project Explorer, although Kevin has access to the folder structure, he can't see any of these files and he can't see them because they're in a work in progress state. So uh, they're not meant for consumption outside the design office. But if I took us down to our search folders and searched under files of for review, yep, Kevin can see all the files of for review. He needs to see them in order to better review them. And he can see all the files are released. So he'll need to see those to continue managing the project. So if we take a look under Kevin's change orders, we can see the change order here we're currently working on. If we look at the status, it's currently in the work state. So we can Oh, I missed a step. I'm sorry, everyone, I'm going to have to go back. I'd need to push it through as me. I need to say I've done this job. So I need to say I submit this from work to review. And I'll say submitted for review. I can't talk and type at the same time. Fantastic. So now I'll log back in as Kevin. And now we'll see Kevin has the ECO in his work list. He will get all, also sent um, a, an email just to remind him he needs to come to Vault and check this out. And, and anybody who's tagged these uh, state changes will see it. So you can tag people who are not involved in the process, just people are manif managers or manufacturing, so they can see this process is happening. So now Kevin would review these files and make sure the changes are, are acceptable to him. But uh, I'm not going to worry about that stage right now. I'm just going to uh, say my response is, well, here I can either reject. So I could say, no, the changes haven't been done to my satisfaction. And you can see from the graph, here, if I if I don't accept this, it'll get pushed back into the open state and then get taken back into the design office again. Or I can choose here approve. And approve just means we're going to go through into that final state. So I'll say approved. Kevin's a nice guy, so I'll say thanks. And I'll click OK. So one final log back out and log back in again. Log back in as Paul M. So if I check out the ECO now, I can see it's in an approved state. That's fantastic. So in order to close out this ECO, um, I need to move it into the closed out state. So I'll respond and say, close the change order, job done. And again, you can set permission controls on these state changes. So you, if uh, if different people need to be responsible for different stages, you can say who's responsible. But I also need to come back to the files. And I'm just going to go to the folder where this file is stored. And you can see it's currently in a for review state. 
So I need to change the state again. And I'm going to change the state to a released state. So that means it can now be released to manufacturing and the manufacturing team will be able to see these files. So let me just catch up. You can see I need to refresh these. So I'll just do a get on these just to make sure I've now got the latest copy. That looks fantastic. You can see all the files are now locked and then a release state. So I'm just gonna log back out once more and log back in as Brian. I'm sorry about all the logging in and logging out, but I'm sure you understand why. And if I look in Brian's project explorer, so Brian remember is manufacturing. So Brian doesn't see any of these files are work in progress. He doesn't see any of the files that are under review. He only sees the files that have been released. Um, and that's because we don't want the manufacturing team to have unreleased data. They should only have the latest release of the files. So um, uh, we could say that you need to look for a file, let's say it's called pedestal. Brian can search the vault. He can find the pedestal assembly we're working on. And again, he could preview that file. He could look at the change orders associated with that file. If I open up that last change order we just completed, we'll be able to see here the comments. So we can see each stage the change order has been through. We can see that it's closed out and submitted to manufacture and we can have a look at the status. So that's a little bit of a whistle stop tour through there. Kevin, I'm going to jump back uh, to your presentation right here and we can just review what we've seen. So I'm changing the presenter back to Kevin. All right. And Paul, can you can just confirm that uh, you can see the summary slide there? We can, thank you very much. So just to summarize the, the whistle stop tour of Vault there that we went through, uh, we looked at the central location for all our product data. That's the Vault, sits on the server and everything goes into the Vaulted server. We looked at check in, check out. That's the process of taking the files from the server to our local C drive, it's all managed by Vault. And it means that although our team can access those files, they can't edit them when we've got them checked out. We briefly looked at revision and change history. So we get that full log of check in, check out. So we can see who made what change and when. Uh, we didn't get to look at copy design wizard today. So that's something I wish I could show you, but we just don't have time for that one as well. In terms of process management, we looked at permissions by workflow. So when you log in, we can allocate permissions, allocate permissions on which files you can see, but also when you can see those files. Can you see them work in progress? Can you see them in a review state? Can you see them when they've been released? Um, we looked at design review and markup very briefly. We mentioned that you can mark up those files directly inside Vault, so you don't need to have separate viewers or separate bits of software. And we looked at the change orders. So we looked at the change order process inside Vault, which just means, again, we have that full log of exactly what happened, why, and when. So it takes that information out of our team's heads and it stores it in a repository where we can refer back to in the future. So I hope you find that useful. I can see there's more questions coming in, so thank you very much. Keep putting your questions in there, and we'll come back to those at the Q&A at the end. So uh, that sounds brilliant. Is that okay with you, Kevin? Yes, yeah, sounds great. So did I did I forget anything? No, no, knocked it out of the park, and uh, you showed nine out of ten on your list, and that's ninety percent with my simple math. <laughs> uh, so great job on the demo, and um, as uh, everyone could see, you know, it was real time in terms of. Uh, how the process management forced you to go back and log back in and make sure that the uh, change process was uh, followed as opposed to anyone skipping any shortcuts. So great job and uh, thanks for highlighting the technology for us.